A promise is a pledge to provide a service. I'm not promising you'll be entertained. I'm not promising we're the best show in town. What I am promising is to teach you biblical truth with practical application. I promise to teach men to fight for their faith, their families, and their futures through the word of God. I'm Douglas Gumby, lead pastor of the Contenders Church. Join us in the fight at contenderschurch.org. In the book of Luke, chapter 10, uh, verse 38 through 42, that's where we'll be all day. I won't travel uh, today. I'll keep this as simple as possible. It simply says in Luke chapter 10, verse 38 through 42. Now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her home. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was coming about with much serving and came to him and said, Lord, Dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful. And Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Today I want to begin to talk about the gap theory. Now, I'm not going to talk about the theological gap theory because most of us ain't ready for that. The theological gap theory is the, the space and time between Genesis 1 and 1 and, and Genesis 1 and 2. Uh, it is a theological uh, a theory that suggests uh, that there was an entirely different creation which some claim was wiped out by Satan's flood. We're not going to get into that. Uh, the Bible refutes a lot of things about that and we can get into that when we begin our Bible study. Uh, to talk about different things that we need to know uh, to be able to defend and, and, and affirm what the Bible has said to us. But today, I want to look at a gap theory. I want to look at the difference or the, the gap between what you experience and what you expect. That's a huge gap sometimes for, for many of us. All right, let me ask you a question. What do you do when, you've ex when what you've experienced is not what you expected? What do you do? I'm going to get a lot of hmms today. I'm not going to get a whole bunch of amens. I can see that in the room. What do you do when what you've experienced is not what you've expected? Sometimes our expectations reach a level that our experience frustrates us. Many will go on summer vacation this year and there will be a gap between what you expected and what you experienced. Some of y'all might not leave because y'all arguing in the marriage. So there's a gap between in your marriage what you expected <laughs> and what you experience. Not only in marriage, but even in church. There's a gap between uh, the people in church between what you expect and what you experience. Your whole life is laid out upon, based upon different experiences and you come in with your own expectation and then we find ourselves frustrated because what we expected was not what we experienced. And so uh, it is today I want to talk to you. Here's a thought. We respond to our frustrations by lowering our expectations because of our experience. Most of the time when we become frustrated, we just say, oh, this is the way it's going to be. And this is what I experienced. And so my experience has taught me not to raise my level of expectation, but to sit here and mutter over. And in, in that effect, in that, that, that train of thought, the effects is that we become hopeless. The effects is that we become negative. The effects is that we become cynical. It is problematic, ladies and gentlemen, to lower your expectation to the level of your experience. The experience of your life will only be height be uh, determined by the height of your expectation. If you don't keep your expectation at an all-time high, your experience will not work well for you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And thank you, Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, if you don't change your expectation, you're going to get just what you experience. You won't get out more than what you wanted to get. You're going to get just what you expected because 
of your experience if your expectation of the church if your expectation of marriage if your expectation of people is rele relegated by your experience of marriage by your experience of the church by your experience of people then you're going to get what you expected plain and simple so might I suggest that instead of lowering your expectations and bringing it down to the level of your experience, might I suggest that you allow God to fill the gap between what you expected and what you experienced. I don't have any heavy revies. That's it. <laughs> That's it. How, how can we allow God? That's what I want to answer for you today in our text how can we allow God to fill the gap because if you're like me or I'm like you we've had a life of experiences that did not go the way we expected them to go we've had a lifetime of expectations that were thwarted by bad or not so good experiences so how can we allow God to fill our expectations and feel the gap between that and our experiences for the time that is ours to share I want to speak from the topic the expectation gap three things the text gives us that I want to share with you uh, today so that you and I can get on the same page as far as filling the gap between our expectation and our experience number one you're going to have disappointed expectations you're going to have disappointed expectations Luke chapter 10 and verse 38 through 40 simply says this now it came to pass as they went that he meaning Jesus entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house and she said had had her and she had her a sister called Mary which also sat at Jesus feet and heard his words but Martha was coming about with much serving and came to him and said Lord Dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. Here, ladies and gentlemen, you are seeing the epitome of a disappointed expectation. Here it is. I want to, I want to express that Martha is disappointed because she expected Mary to come help her. What I like about Martha is that uh, uh, she did not hold her tongue when it came to her expectations. Some of y'all in the room cannot hold your tongue when it comes to your expectations and that's not a bad thing. The thing about it is when you communicate, the other person on the other side needs to understand fully what it is you expect and if you do not detail it for that individual, then you're going to have a disappointed expectation what I what I want to give Martha credit for is that she said exactly what she wanted to say she did not bite her tongue she did not hold back on anything she said what she was thinking she didn't get an attitude she didn't give the silent treatment she didn't go into the other room and turn the, 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 the playoffs on is she looking is she looking is she looking But Martha was coming about with much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me uh, to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. This is where we mostly find ourselves. We can readily identify here our own struggles. We can readily point out another person's weakness. We can readily see what someone else isn't doing. We tend to expect people to see us and automatically empathize with where we are at a particular moment in our lives. The true issue in this text, in, in the book of Luke chapter 10, verse 38, I'll read it for you again because most of us just missed it. Now it came to pass as they went that he, meaning Jesus, entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. We got to stop right there. That's, that's the issue. You expect people to come into your presence. You expect people to come into your house and pick up empathy for doing things that you supposed to do in your own. You mean to tell me 
that Martha got mad at Mary because Jesus came to her house and it was her house and she was performing as only she thought she should. She was serving and going over and above and here it is, my own sister is sitting at the feet of Jesus while I'm doing all the work. Okay, we can, we can flip that into your, your personal scenario. How dare he? Gonna go sit in there. The trash need to be taken out. I'm trying to cook dinner. My feet hurt. Can't say nothing about y'all. Say your feet hurt. <laughs> Charles Hodge, Hodge says this. As the church is the aggregate of believers, there is an intimate analogy between the experience of the individual believer and the church as a whole. And I believe, maybe I might be wrong, but if I, if I am, I will apologize. But I believe that the church is made up, just like he just stated, of individual people coming in with individual expectations, walking out with a bad experience, and having a whole lot to say about the little that they know. And we have got to get on the same page. That is why, let me say it publicly, we don't have a lot of games. That is why we don't have a lot of gimmicks. That is why we don't have a lot of extracurricular stuff because at the end of the day, all I want to give you is what the word says because the word is enough. If you want to understand the expectation gap, you've got to understand you will have disappointed expectations. Not only will you have disappointed expectations, you are going to have to accept authoritative correction now you hear this from me I will say this publicly and I've said it before I will not manipulate you based on my authority I have a huge problem with people in authority using their authority to correct people for their own benefit if I am going to correct something it is going to be for your benefit not mine Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And thank you, Jesus. Luke chapter 10, verse 41. I didn't want to get off subject, so I came back. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. This is the status of most believers. You are sitting in here, and right now, while you're listening to me, you are careful and troubled about many things. Yes, you're sitting in the chair. Yes, you're taking notes. Yes, you're nodding your head. You might even say amen, but you are careful and troubled about many things. Here in our story, we discover that Martha is trying to impose impose a standard uh, uh, on someone else that may or may not be that person's calling. Whoa. We already identified that this is Martha's house. You know where your plates are, you know where no, your dishes are. I'm the type person, let me, let me share with you and be real for a few seconds. Uh, not that I'm being fake, but just let me share something outside of the preaching category. I'm the type person, when you get in my car, everything you brought in my car, you need to take out your car. Don't leave no, I know, you know what, if it's dirt on the floor, I put that dirt there and I ain't mad at that dirt. But if you put your chewing gum paper and it fall out, that's yours, get it out my car. The dirt was there before you got here. I'm sorry, y'all, come on back. <laughs> Martha had a spiritual gift that is not mentioned too many times in the Bible. She had a spiritual gift that I want to acknowledge as GTD, getting things done. But the problem with her spiritual gift is that her spiritual gift turned into resentment. I want to give you an example of a story that I read a man walked up to his pastor and proclaimed these words, Pastor, we need to help the homeless. The pastor agreed. The pastor said, yes, we do need to help the homeless. Then the pastor said, I believe that you are passionate about helping the homeless. I believe that you should help the homeless. How can we assist you in helping the homeless? See, the problem is we have a passion about things but we want to take our passion, we want to take our burden and put
on somebody else and say, well, you need to do this because I'm passionate about it. That's what Mary is doing in this situation. Mary is passionate about serving. Jesus is here. This is my brother's best friend and Jesus is sitting in my house. The one who has performed miracles. The one who has, she ain't raised Lazarus. He ain't raised Lazarus from the dead yet. But he's going to do that next time. He's sitting in my house and while he's here and all these people that have come with him, I'm going to serve him because he's worthy to be served like I want to serve him. But the problem is, I get mad when my sister took a seat instead of helping me. You know, blood thickening in water, but I can put some oil in there <laughs> and change the consistency. <laughs> when the pastor said, I believe that you should help the homeless. I believe that you are passionate about helping the homeless. How can we help you help the homeless? The man walked away confused and frustrated because what he experienced is not what he expected. Helping the homeless was his burden. He wanted to take his burden and give his burden to someone else, Martha comes to Jesus and pleads her case. This is what I need to point out. Jesus didn't just sit there and be Jesus and be gracious. He wasn't silent. He was tasteful, but he reprimanded her right where she stood. You remember when your mama used to get you in the big star, y'all walk down and you, you, and she get that little pinch on you and it, you, you just like she got a half a smidge of skin and she twisted so much so you can't say nothing because you in so much. This little bit of skin put you in that much. I just had a flashback. I'm coming back. <laughs> Jesus reproved Martha. Although he was a guest at her house, Martha, Martha's fault was her obsession, her obsessive attention to entertain him. Martha expected Jesus to justify her service to him by making her sister come serve because she was passionate about serving him. He said that ain't the case. He, he, he reproved her by name just in case you don't know I'm talking to you. Martha, Martha. They probably called her Maddie for short, but when they called her whole name, my name is Doug. When you call my whole name, I feel like I'm in trouble. I don't want to hear Douglas. I hate that. I, I hate that because I was always in trouble when I heard Douglas. <laughs> my name is Doug. I'm good with that. But don't call her name Maddie. But you know, Martha, Martha. You know you're in trouble at that point. Jesus repeated her name, Martha, Martha. Jesus speaks as one in earnest and deeply concerned for her welfare. He's not just fussing at her, but he's fussing for a reason because she's lost focus. He reproved Martha, Maddie, for caring too much. Martha was careful and troubled about many things. Jesus was not pleased that she should think to please him with a rich and splendid entertainment. Jesus was not pleased that she was perplexed trying to please him. Martha was the one who had the problem, but her perception was that there was something wrong with Mary. This is where it gets quiet and this is why I suggest you say amen because many of us are the one with the problem. But we look across the room at something who or at someone who is not as passionate about our problem as we are and we blame them. I'm gonna go on. To understand the expectation gap, not only will you have disappointed expectation, but you also must accept authoritative correction. And lastly, this is the hard part. Simply do what is needed. That's the hard part. Because in our minds, we go for extravagance. In our mind, we want to prove to somebody how passionate we are. 
We want to go over and above to prove to a whole bunch of folk who honestly don't care how passionate you are. Do what is needed. Verse 42, Luke chapter 10. But one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. When we entered this message, I asked a simple question. What do you do when what you've experienced is not what you expected? The answer is simple and, and, and yet complex at the same time. To simply do what is needed. Martha has taught us an invaluable lesson today. She, like us, has overplanned. She, like us, has overprepared. I don't know about you, but I'm the type of person, if I know I'm about to do something, I will have it all laid out. It may not be on paper, but in my mind, if you mess up my time frame, if you, it has a certain thing. It, it, it throws everything off. And I'm, 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 I'm notorious for having all of this stuff worked out in my mind because this is my level of expectation. And this is what my experience has taught me. If I show up at a certain time, I think that 15 minutes too early is already late. That's what they taught us. Be there at 15 minutes, you already late. You didn't give yourself time enough to prepare. My experience has me in a place 45 minutes just in case some pop off. I know I'm weird. I ain't got nothing else to do. <laughs> she like us has overplanned, overprepared, and, and now overplease. Do you know you can overplease, folk? Oh, you didn't know that. You'll find out. Keep living. Ironically, all of her planning, all of her preparation, all of her pleasing was done to perform a duty that Jesus said wasn't even needed. Jesus has come to a certain city, to a certain woman's house named Martha. And when he got there, all he wanted to do was bless the people. All he wanted to do was teach and Martha, this is some of y'all, you get a surprise. Some pop up in your life, you in the cupboard, you over here. I know I got something over here, some water, it's something around here. Uh, I'm going to fix you something in a second, be that be in a second. Uh, I know it's some, uh, let me see, I got some rice and uh, put that over there. And then, oh, there let me put this with beans. Uh, and you go to finding stuff to fix, you go to finding stuff to make folk comfortable. Folk didn't ask for all of that. You wanted to do all of that. Preach, Pastor Gumby. I'm doing the best that I can. All the stuff she did was to perform a duty that wasn't even needed. Luke chapter 10, verse 41 through 42. Go back up. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, you are careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary have chosen that good part which shall not be taken from her. What's the good part? It's right there in the text, verse 39. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. You mean to tell me I'm in here cooking all of this mess? You mean to tell me I went all the way upstairs, put all my makeup on? You mean to tell me I went to the back of the closet, got them shoes that hurt my feet? Because you can't say nothing about a woman unless you're talking about a feet hurt. Because you will go to the nth degree trying to manage all the details, but one thing is needful, one thing. We, we overlook the one thing is needed to do the stuff that ain't nobody worrying about. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Let's do a quick recap. Martha has invited Jesus to her house or Jesus has popped up. Martha has prepared for Jesus to be entertained inside her house. Jesus arrives as Martha goes over and above to serve him. Jesus is teaching. 
He's teaching. And while Jesus teaching, is teaching, everyone is seated and listening except everybody sitting here listening except Roy. I'm joking, but I saw him standing up. He got the baby. Everybody listening, but he's, he, he's, he's coming about with other stuff. Many of you sitting in here listening, but you still running around in your mind. So you got to wait for me to load the doggone video so you can replay it when you get downtime. Not with your work schedule, not with your, your busy life. But I'm talking about when you allow your mind to rest, you go back and look at what God said. You are doing too much. But you ain't doing what's needed. Preach, Pastor Gumby. I'm doing the best that I can. Mary is seated at Jesus' feet. Now, with all of that stuff in play, Jesus is teaching. Everybody sitting down except for Martha. Mary is seated at his feet. Martha looks in to see Jesus teaching. And look at what she did. She looks to see Mary learning. And she exclaims her frustration. She might, I, I can't say she, she came in the room, but she was probably in the kitchen still trying to serve. Look at, look at her right there. I'm sitting at his feet. How you going to sit? I got all this stuff going on. You my sister, blood thicker than water, but I'm changing my DNA today. And I'm putting the, all this stuff together. And, and somewhere, I don't know if she walked in the room or she said it out loud from another room, but Jesus responded to what she said. I don't know about you, but you get frustrated and you go to talking to yourself and ain't nobody else there. Maybe it's just me. Or uh, maybe you have a whole conversation and the person you talking to ain't even there, but in your mind, they there. And whatever you say to them, you know they respond. So you go to talk, or is it just me or am I crazy? You go to talking about wish you would. How you gonna say it? Some of y'all schizophrenic. We're gonna work on that in a few minutes. Y'all come on back. <laughs> She somehow exclaims her frustration and in the midst of being cumbered about with much serving. She said, I wish my sister would get up and come in here and help me prepare for Jesus. And Jesus, I love it. He stops teaching to teach a lesson. <laughs> he stops teaching to teach a lesson. In verse 41, Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, you're coming about and, and, and you're careful about many things. But one thing is needful. And here's what I want to highlight. And Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken from her. Everybody else came in your house to be served. And it's your house. See, what you fail to realize is if I'm a guest in your house, it's my job as a guest to make your service to me as light as possible. I know you're going to offer. You want some water? You want some? No, I, I just came to visit. You want something to eat? You hungry? No, I just came to visit. And, and here, Mary, Mark, excuse me, is just like most of us, trying to fix what ain't broken trying to resolve what ain't even an issue trying to to put uh, uh, some type of parameters around how faithful I am when all I want to do is build your faith Jesus said to her I'm gonna I'm paraphrase it so you can understand go sit down Martha, Martha, you're careful and, and, and encumbered with a whole bunch of stuff. Paraphrase, go sit down. Look at your life right now, right now. Stop listening to the message 
and go back to thinking what you was thinking before I got your attention. You are cumbered and careful about too many things that you can't fix right now. And the problem with most people, your pastor included, is that I have experiences that have garnered my level of expectation. Or I have an expectation that has ruined an experience. And what you and I have to do is realize we got disappointed expectations. Realize we need authoritative correction. And realize that we simply got to do what is needed. Go sit down. Hear from God. Release yourself from your expectations. Release yourself from your experiences. And let the word of God fill the void in your life. The sad part is you get it now. You're in church now. It makes sense now. Tomorrow is another thing. You're going to go back to yesterday and pick up last night before Mayweather won and you're going to pick up all the frustration. You're going to pick up all before the Clippers beat the Spurs. You're going to pick up all of that stuff tomorrow. Because we don't do what's needed. Because we've trained ourselves. This is my experience or this is my expectation. And this is how I handle it. And I'm learning to take all my experiences and throw them out the window. I'm learning, it's a hard thing because I've had a lot of experiences. Some good, some not so good, some I hate it. I'm taking, I'm learning to say, God, thank you for the experience. Thank you for allowing me to experience that. Thank you for teaching me what that experience was about. But I also thank you for my level of expectation. Because what I've done is I frustrated myself trying to depend on my experience, knowing that my experience was never enough. So God forgive me for lowering my expectation based on my human experience. That is how you fill a void. When you move you out of the equation, you, do you realize you are taking up space that you don't belong in? Do you realize that you are handling stuff that you can't fix? <laughs> don't you realize you are your worst problem? Not what you're facing. It's the person that's facing the problem. And how you resolving it. You can't fix it. You can't adjust it. It all has to go back to him. Go sit down. Hear from God. Release your experience. Release your expectation. Allow the word to get in your life and build you to where he designed you to be. Lord, I thank you. I magnify you. I bless you for your word. I could not do this without you. You are my source. You are my strength. And that is my prayer that your people see. Not a preacher, not a pastor, not even a mere man, but a vessel that only you can feel. A vessel that you can uh, place inside what you desire. God, today, as this word has gone forth, allow your people to be strengthened and to move forward and to look at their lives and, and to look at their expectations, but also look at their experiences and appreciate you the more. I give you praise. It is in Jesus' name I pray.